the Fantasy Edge with Jonathan Chan, Kevin Quo, Richard Seville. Hello everyone and welcome to the Fantasy Edge. Uh, my name is Jonathan Chan, joined as always by the two co-hosts, Richard Seville and Kevin Huo, uh, for the third preseason edition of the show. And this will be quite news-filled, as is a busy week in the NFL. Uh, Kevin, Richard, how's it going? Not too bad, can't complain. Uh, great to be back here for another uh, edition. All right. Well, as I just mentioned, it was quite a busy week for uh, for fantasy relevant players. So I guess we'll just dive right into uh, into the news. I guess the first one is a tweet from Adam Schefter about Dalvin Cook, who everybody's been a little bit concerned about uh, throughout the preseason about the possibility of a holdout. And uh, Schefter said on a podcast that if Cook hadn't signed a new contract by the start of the season, then he would be uh, he would give pause to the idea of drafting him in fantasy. Uh, for Richard, I guess, does this, I guess, give you pause to take take and get Dalvin Cook in the top half of the uh, of the first round of drafts? This is still kind of a wait and see. There's two two weeks to go in the season. And uh, while I do know in our F6P league, we're not drafting until the very last uh, minute. So we're, we're I think we're drafting on sep- in September 9th. But for people who are drafting now or next week, uh, I think you, I think you still, I think you still draft him as a, as a first round draft pick. I, th- I think he wants to play. So I, I, I don't know how much I think, I think you just go ahead and draft him because either way, they're going to get him signed. Um, depending on how this, uh, season quote in quotes goes, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm more inclined to, uh, to, to stay the course with Dalvin Cook. Um, if you're drafting next week uh, and and nothing's changed, I think you still I think you still go ahead. Uh, just uh, stay the course. And Kevin, with the news, does Cook change for you? And if he does, how much higher are you drafting Alex Madison as a, as a handcuff? Um, he doesn't change too much for me. I mean, I just don't really know enough about the verbiage of the contract because I mean we've dealt with holdouts before, and for some reason, like Le'Veon Bell missed the whole year. But Zeke and Melvin Gordon didn't miss the whole year. They only missed a couple games. So I don't really understand the verbiage of it. Um, <clears throat> as far as Madison, though, that's that's the interesting one for me. I'm probably a little bit higher on him, and I'd probably ra- I'd probably want to get him as more than just a pure handcuff at this point. Um, seems like he might have some outside value, especially since Cook can't really stay healthy or hasn't proven to be the healthiest person in the past. Yeah, that's basically, yeah, if you're drafting next week, uh, you've got to take Madison, obviously. If you've taken Cook, you've got to take Madison. And Madison that's, also goes up. Just as insurance. For me, that's an issue with, you know, Dalvin Cook being drafted so high, you know, mid top six in the first round, that if you're drafting a running back in the first round, and to, to say that, oh, you need this handcuff that's being drafted in what, the eighth, ninth round, that's a lot of value you're losing on, you know, a per, like an end of the, you know, end of rotation starter or a top bench guy for somebody that realistically isn't going to play that much. Well, I've seen it many times. We've seen it one year, uh, the first week of the season. Uh, David Johnson was uh, a 1.01 to two or three years ago, and uh, he went down first week of the season. And if you didn't have that handcuff, uh, I mean, you, that's your first round pick. I mean, you, your next pick in the, in the draft is like 23 spots away if you're in a 12 team. So... Um, I think it's I think it's kind of worth it to get a handcuff if you've got uh, like a very high draft pick, like if you're 1.01. Because I mean that David Johnson, like that was a disaster. People like gave up on fantasy football after that. It was so severe to uh, somebody's fantasy football team. I don't know if you remember that, John uh, or Kev. I guess the point I was, uh, I guess the worry, the red flag with Cook is that if going into it, you know, you're you're supposed to be the, like the rock. You're going into it saying, oh, this guy's injury prone. Oh, this guy might hold out. Oh, I need his backup. That's not really what you want in a first round pick. And he's kind of off, oh, I see. Well, off yeah. my board ish. I see what you mean. I mean, he's he's absolutely sliding down my rankings. I think at the beginning of the preseason, I'm probably out on that like RB5, RB6, probably right after McCaffrey, Barkley, Elliott, Kamara, Henry. He was probably a solid six for me, but as the offseason's kind of gone on, he's gone closer to the back end, closer to like eight or nine, like nine, ten, something like that. Like, I'll definitely take C, uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire over him. I'd probably take Mixon over him at this point, probably take Sanders Drake over him. Mixon? Um, yeah, Mixon's fine. Mixon, I think that offense is going to be good. Mm-hmm. Um, no, but, just thought it was uh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, your point 
in losing that eighth or ninth round pick is a big one because in the eighth or ninth round pick, that's like a wide receiver three. And if you have to essentially draft a handcuff, I mean, I'm never one to really handcuff, but Dalvin Cook is someone that you do have to handcuff. Um, yeah, if you're if you're losing out on possibly like I don't know a, a Tyler Boyd or something like that just to have Dalvin Cook, I would just rather have Joe Mixon. You know what I mean? Yeah. Definitely. I that's, think that's uh, what you're going to say, right? But, yeah. I didn't want to say. But I see. But you see, right. the thing is, is that you can't do that with somebody like Christian McCaffrey. You can't. You can't say, well, if, like if Ka- Christian McCaffrey uh, gets injured after week two, you because there really isn't. On the Panthers, there really isn't. Uh, I know Mike Davis is sort of making a play for uh, being the backup, but I think it'd be a committee if anything happened to McCaffrey. the The issue of handcuffs is is so divisive uh, in the fantasy community. There are those who who say you should insure your um, guy, which is fair. I mean, I used to think that way. I still do to a point, like in cases like this Dalvin Cook thing, where it, where it, where it is uh, kind of important. Like, and people were doing that like last year with Ezekiel Elliott when he was doing his holdout. Remember? Yeah, I mean, for me, handcuffing is just a thing. If if I know the guy, if I know the RB one in this case, Dalvin Cook gets hurt, and the backup that I'm drafting is immediately going to step in and be an RB one, like Madison would be. I don't know that for Christian McCaffrey because, like you said, there's no one back there. Same thing with Saquon Barkley. Like, I'm not handcuffing those guys because their handcuffs suck. Yeah. Hey, you leave Wayne Gallman out of this. Is he even on the roster? <laughs> it's just the first name I thought of. I, yeah. I, I don't know who the guy is. I assume it's Gallman. Dion Lewis, but I, I don't they, they know. Dion Lewis. Perkins, right? so, uh, Dion oh, yeah. Lewis is Dion the guy. Dion Lewis, yeah. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah, yeah, no. There's no point. Uh, moving on. This is, we don't want this to become the uh, Dalvin Cook show, but and moving on to another uh, RB one that you mentioned there that you that jumped ahead of Cook, uh, Kenyon Drake was seen in a walking boot this week. Uh, both he and Cliff Kingsbury kind of made light of the situation. Drake saying that you know he was in a boot this time last year, so he's just staying consistent, making sure his routine's the same. Uh, same question: uh, Is there any concern over his foot, knowing that Drake's been kind of uh, held back due to some nagging injuries uh, over the past few years, Kevin? Um. Of course there's concern. I, I think one of my main concerns going into the season about Drake is that he's never proven he can do it. I mean, yeah, he did it for a 12-game stretch, but um, even before that, he was kind of hit or miss. Uh, do I have a lot of concern because of the walking boot? Not necessarily, because I think these things do happen, but it's just another reminder that um, he might not be you know, an 80% of the touches kind of guy. Like They do have other talent in that backfield, so... I mean, Chase Edmonds is a guy that I've been pumping up all offseason, and I'm not saying that he's going to overtake Drake, but I think he might surprise and, and kind of do uh, do some things that complement Drake. Yeah, I think Chase Edmonds is a good player. Yeah, I like I like I like the way he plays football. Watching him uh, watching him play was uh, I mean, he even outplayed uh, David Johnson, and uh, well, David Johnson just didn't look. Yeah. Like Everyone David Johnson David last year. Yeah, yeah, David Johnson wasn't David Johnson last year. That was bad after his injury. No, he wasn't very good. And but again, this is sort of ties into that uh do you handcuff him or not? And since Chase Edmonds is such a low handcuff, you're not whereas Madison is a bit of a higher handcuff, so you know, you kinda 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 gotta spend a little more draft capital on him. But Chase Edmonds is so low low, um, you can pick up Kenyon Drake and then get Chase Edmonds for for a lot cheaper since uh, since he is more of a truer handcuff because Madison does mix in in the offense. Well, uh, Chase Edmonds, let's not forget Eno Benjamin as well. They bring some uh, some really good reviews coming out of uh, Cardinals camp about him, the rookie. Uh, so we'll have to see how that works out behind uh, behind Drake if he does get hurt. Uh, I guess the last round, first round running back I'll touch on. I know we touched on uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire a little bit a couple weeks ago. Um, just about his rising draft stock and everything. But the Kansas City GM threw some more fuel onto the fire the other day, saying that he will be the primary ball handler and is in for a big year. Uh, I guess, is this increasing the confidence that nothing screwy is going to happen with his touches and that he is going to be, you know, the, the do it all three down back uh, in Kansas City, Richard? Uh, I, th- I think that's probably where it's gearing toward. But I, I am also in the back of my mind. It's almost, you know, Damian Williams was supposed to be the, uh, the all around back, but, um, Andy Reid went and got, uh, uh, Shady McCoy. And now this year he's, he's, uh, he's, uh, picked up, uh, Dwayne Washington, who happens to be the most experienced, uh, so he wants an experienced back mixing in. So I'm not sure if it'll be committee ish, but, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's, uh, Clyde Edwards Hilaire is going to be the, uh, not, not a, I wouldn't say bell cow, but 
you're you're looking at uh, upwards of 15 to 20 touches a, a game with uh, with the others mixed in. Probably Daryl Williams. I don't know about Darwin Thompson. I think um, th- it's it's either Daryl Williams or, or Darwin Thompson. I know Andy Reid likes both, but I think he prefers Daryl Williams. But uh, as for uh, Dwayne Washington, Dwayne Washington, he's a guy to watch uh, in the in their offense. But uh, I think it's I think it's Edwards Hilaire. He's 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 a pretty safe pick. And uh, I know uh, Kevin just mentioned he's moved him up the draft board. I don't see anything wrong with that. If you if you feel the inclination to uh, draft him higher than his uh, nominal ADP. Yep. And uh, Kevin, you took him at number five in the X uh, the F six P mock we did last week. Uh, is that about where you uh, where you're comfortable ranking him and taking him if this is your uh, your home your money league? Yeah, I think I think a lot of people are are trying to talk themselves out of Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I think um everything he he's kind of a great intersection of everything that you want. He marks all the boxes for like a first round running back. Uh he's got the talent, he's got the opportunity, he's got the offensive scheme and the ability and the like he's an offense that's gonna score touchdowns. And all these people are trying to kind of like overthink it, like, oh, DeAndre Washington, oh, what about Daryl Williams? Like, these dudes are backups. Like, DeAndre Washington has been a backup for four years in Oakland. He backed up Marshawn Lynch when Marshawn Lynch was when you're off retirement. Like, these guys are not anything special. And Clyde Edwards Hilaire is getting Brian at Westbrook comp from the head coach. Like, I think at a certain point, you just take it for what it is. The guy is going to be a stud. Yeah, and not only that, um, in the sense of, uh, if you remember Christian McCaffrey's rookie year, um, n- if it were Christian McCaffrey and his, like, everybody exploded on him, not knowing what he had. Uh, but once uh, once the season got going, uh, Christian McCaffrey was, uh, you know, uh, very highly regarded. I think it's a similar situation, isn't it, Kev? Like, yeah, I mean, first round picks, that, that's, it is what it is. Like, if you're a first round running back, you just get the opportunity. That's just how it goes. I, don't, I can't really think of a running back who got drafted in the first round that wasn't immediately thrown into the fire. Yeah. I guess my, the one that comes to mind is Mark Ingram, but that was years ago, and they had pretty talented backs back there too. Yeah. Was was Bishop Sankey first round? Oh, no, he was second uh, round. No. Because no. <laughs> uh, uh, you know when when I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't I didn't blink when when Kevin took uh, Clyde Edwards Hiller uh, fifth in our mock. I didn't think of it. I didn't think of it as. I thought, okay, you know, he thinks that, I mean, I didn't think it was like, uh, like, uh, you know, eye popping or anything like that. It was, it was just like, okay, what you think that's where you're thinking. It's, it's, you can think like that and it's, it's perfectly fine. I tend to think it was, uh, I tend to think that fifth is a little bit bold, but, but it's not bad. All right. And I guess the big news of today, uh, that would be today's Wednesday. Tuesday. Today's Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. Uh, big news of Wednesday is David Montgomery uh, went down during Bears practice and was reportedly carted off, but then was later said to have walked off under his own power uh, with a lower body injury. Uh, some are saying the knee, some are saying it was a groin strain. Uh, Kevin, does this help Tariq Cohen, or is he, is he already entrenched in his role enough that whatever other backups the Bears have are going to be you know, the the guy to take over David Montgomery's carries if he misses time. Yeah, that that's what it's going to be. Uh, if David Montgomery is forced to miss time, I'm seeing somewhere it could be three or four weeks, which could be, you know, into week two of the season. Um, Tariq Cohen is going to do what he does. He's not going to change his role. They're not going to handle the ball 20 times a game. That'd be insane. Um, I fully expect them to bring in a veteran or trade for somebody because the only other two running backs on the roster right now are – uh, some guy named Ryan Nall and some guy named Artavis Pierce. No disrespect to them, but I have no idea who the hell they are. Um, there's a lot of teams with surplus running backs out there. I mean, uh, obviously Gus Edwards comes to mind. Um, hope maybe the you really want to- Gus Edwards off the team, don't you? Yeah, it's not that I want him off the team. He I'm wants off- assets. He does. He wants him I, off the he team. He wants Ravens <laughs> assets. Yeah, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to win. Not a, I, got, I love Gus Edwards. I'd love to see him flourish in Chicago. I just know he's not going to get 80 carries this year because J.K. Dobbins is a monster. No, but it just seems like every time there's a every time there's sort of like a trade rumor going on, or, oh, we could, we, we, could, we could trade Gus Edwards for him. And, and, and a third round pick <laughs> next year. If the Bears, I will say this: if the Bears trade for Gus Edwards, Gus Edwards will be in a fifty-fifty split with David Montgomery by the end of the season. Yeah. Gus Edwards is good, That's but he's just, not as good as Ingram, and he's not as good as Jake Dobbins. But I just gotta know why every package deal you come up with always includes Gus Edwards. Because he's he's talented, but he's unnecessary. On he's extra on the team. 
He's what are we gonna do with three talented running backs? I know. <laughs> and Justice Hill. And Justice Hill. Yeah. Yeah, see. And Lamar Jackson, who's a running back. <laughs> He's a wide receiver, excuse you. Yeah, sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh speaking of wide receivers, a couple of uh well, one charger and one former charger. We'll start with Tyrell Williams. Uh reported that he tore his labrum uh this week and will attempt to play through it uh, after a couple weeks of rehab during the season uh tyrell was already uh an end of the draft kind of flyer guy as the i guess as the number two receiver on the raiders now barring whatever rugs does but uh is this now the brian edwards show is he gonna take over richard or is it gonna be more renfro and and rugs well i have to tell you i don't know much about edwards to be honest but uh as for as for this this is actually the first time i've heard about this injury um i was never high on tyrell williams to begin with i wasn't i wasn't high on this on this raiders offense to begin with uh you know renfro is renfro's not the 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 tyrell williams type of style uh, um renfro is more of a um he's kind of in that cole beasley um type of type of player to me so i don't i don't expect it to be uh unless they unless they move people around and and so forth um just checking i'm just gonna check on this check on how bad this injury is um it's torn labor week to week yeah so brian edwards and henry yeah see i don't know much about henry i don't know much i'll have to i'll have to pass this over to over to kev because brian edwards is not on my radar at all okay yeah that's i'll take that pass because brian edwards is on my radar he's one of my my favorite late round sleepers. Um, he's a third round pick. He's uh, typical. He's like one of those six uh, three, two twenty ish guys who can run and you know catch those kind of you know prototypical X receivers uh, or Z receivers, I guess. Um, yeah, I Derek Carr compared him to James Jones. Said he's a reliable guy, you know, who can get 50-50 balls. And with Derek Carr throwing the ball, that that's something that is very necessary. Um, Tyrell Williams, I think his injury only helps Brian Edwards kind of inserting himself into that offense a little bit. Since, like you said, Hunter Renfro is never going to be that guy. And I don't know about Ruggs. I have little questions about him. But, um, yeah, I'm always sold on the kind of big-bodied receivers who can run. So I do like Brian Edwards in late in my draft. Yeah, I mean, Williams has tried to play through these kind of injuries before, but even last year, his targets were down. He's playing through injury again. And even toward the end of the year, like at the start of the year, he caught a lot of touchdowns. He was producing for them, but got hurt, came back. The targets weren't there. The touchdowns weren't there. And it's very clear the Raiders were looking for somebody else to take over. So Williams is probably off the board for the most part now until he proves he can come back healthy. Uh, Moving on to Mike Williams now. He, uh, just like Tyrell, suffered a shoulder injury uh, in practice, suffered a shoulder sprain again uh, week to week. Is Keenan Allen's stock now a little bit higher? Are some of the concerns about, you know, the target numbers going to be alleviated now that uh, Tyrod has to throw a little bit more to him? Uh, Richard? I think that's probably a good idea to do that because uh um Tyrod Taylor's more of a more of a a, a dump off type of type of uh uh passer. I, I I don't I don't really I don't really consider Tyrod Taylor like, you know, like the deep the deep ball because that's that's basically what Mike Williams is uh his uh, forte is it's it's kind of like the uh he's he's kind of the 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 home run ball type of guy. Um in fact, I remember Several times he saved my fantasy bacon just like like a fourth quarter like long you know pass caught so I don't know who the other long passing uh, pass catching uh, guy is on the uh, on the Chargers so uh, this is I think I think what it really does what it, who it really helps is Hunter Henry of all people um, if he's if he's off because I think Hunter Henry will get uh, a lot more work so uh, it just. Just judging by the offense and how I think it'll be structured, uh, I I don't think I don't think it's I don't think it's a big loss to the offense because I think I don't think Williams is losing any. Uh, he's he's kind of floated around like he's he's not been a really uh, he isn't a high temperature target in fantasy this year. He's I don't know I'd put him sort of like low to medium temperature of uh, you know if that of, of a target. So, um, so people aren't, you aren't losing anything by, uh, passing on Mike Williams anyway. So, um, that's just how I feel about it. Kev. Yeah. Mike Williams isn't someone I'm high on this year. I just, <clears throat> um, he got a thousand yards on 90 targets, 50 catches. That's 20 yards for a second. That's, and it was an insane pace that I don't really think Tyrod Taylor can support. Um, yeah. and 
I, I can't imagine that he's going to get more targets, so you're kind of capped out at 90 targets. Yeah. Um, if he catches the same amount and the yardage and the efficiency goes down, sure, the touchdowns might go up, but that still leaves you with like a borderline wide receiver four. It's just nothing too interesting for me. I don't see the ceiling for him. So, I mean, with this injury, he might miss two games, so that brings it down even lower. For me. Yeah, and he's an air yards guy too, so, <laughs> right? Uh, Kev, he's an air yards type of uh, receiver, and right. Tyrod Taylor. Tyrod Taylor just does does not, like you say, support an air yards receiver. Uh, he used to in Buffalo. He used to kind of air it out with Sammy Watkins, but nowadays I think he's a little bit older. I don't think he's that type of guy anymore. He certainly wasn't with the Browns. Yeah, I remember him not being able to pass to Josh Gordon. What a waste that was. It's the worst thing you could possibly do. Yeah, just not pass to Josh Gordon all day. Come on, oh. obviously a waste. Oh, you that. mean like Tom Brady hardly ever throwing to him? Uh, Tom Brady wasn't throwing to anybody when Josh Gordon was playing for the Patriots. Well, I don't know, and and uh, neither did Russell. He did. He for snap snap counts. He actually did throw to him quite a bit more than Brady was. Mister Unlimited, gotta be unlimited. You just want to work that in there, didn't you? I had to. Gotta be. Gotta be on the- yep. Uh, well, speaking of Brady receivers, beautiful segues here. Uh, Chris Godwin has sat out three of the last six uh, Buccaneers practices. Uh, when asked, Bruce Arian said, that's for me to know and for nobody else to know. Um, is there any concern that Godwin's hurt or is this just getting uh, veteran getting rest days kind of thing and Arian's just kind of trying to emulate Belichick and make Brady happy? Kev? No, there, there's there's got to be something going on because he is not that much of a veteran. I think he's been in the league three years. So he, if he's not, if like Mike Evans isn't sitting out, there's no reason Chris Godwin should be sitting out unless he's got probably some kind of nagging injury. It's probably nothing big, but it is what it is. Uh, especially considering that, you know, he's trying to get on the same page with a new quarterback. Like you need as many reps as you possibly can get. So for him to be sitting out, it must be some, somewhat serious. That being said, I don't think it's serious enough for me to like not draft. It's just, you know, I think that's so weird weird those are so, the, that's one of the weirdest words me to know and for you to find out whenever you hear that i always i think it might be something like uh um it could be a personal issue it could be it could be anything like it could be he could be suffering from depression or something who knows you know like it just it might be just depressed or something he's he's had a uh he's had a breakup or something or or he's I don't know, maybe he's moving, <laughs> you know, I don't know, so, uh, you know, like, th- things get players down, Pl- players are people too, and I think Arians is, is being a little coy about it, because so um, Godwin is probably just coming to a, c- could be something just simple as that, so, um, I, I, f- I still find it interesting, I don't know what it could be. Yeah, well, we'll find out soon enough, like, like Kevin said, I'm sure it's nothing serious, Godwin will play, but... It could be a nagging thing, maybe a soft tissue injury, like a calf strain or something, but she'll play all however many games are played this year. Um, I guess one quick thing that I'll mention, because we have to throw it in every week, uh, Sonny Michelle is not is no longer on the uh, the PUP list, so he will play, and right. now the Patriots right. backfield is just infinitely more muddled. Uh, Damien Harris hype is gone. Sony Michelle's going to come back in and fall down at the first t- sign of contact. So I'm back to avoiding everybody in that backfield except for James White. Hashtag on brand. No, no, no. Damien Harris hype still lives. Oh, because Sony's going to get hurt game one? Yeah. Also, he's bad at football. <laughs> he's he's not that great, you know, John. He's really not. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm well aware. I say this every week, Richard. Sony Michelle is not a good football player. Especially not good enough to be drafted above Nick Chubb. I just don't hope they push. They should. They should try and push some of the. I think uh, Damian Williams will get some. The problem is, as usual, with the Patriots' offense and the way Belichick likes to run the backfield, it's always like mix, mix, mix. You never know. One week, you know, suddenly, you know, first series, and there's what the hell's Burkhead doing out there? You know what I mean? So. This is that's the problem. Is that when you're when you're you know it's the first quarter, the uh, Patriots' first possession, and Burkhead's out there. Why? Just to throw people off, you know. That's that's the Belichick way. Just and also we hate your fantasy football team. Well, with Belichick, the first drive is always super super scripted, and it usually works. It's afterwards that is the troubling the troubling drives. Hmm. Anyways, let's move on to uh, man. That was a long long news segment. Uh, our feature of the week, which is our uh, bust picks. Uh, 
again, as always, busts are not somebody that we think is you know going to be garbage, just that might not perform up to their uh, current draft price. Uh, I'll start with the quarterbacks. Kevin, you want to go with uh, one of your two there? I'll let you pick. Uh, sure. So my bust, uh, thanks for giving us the preface because I don't think Deshaun Watson is going to be trash. I just don't think he's worth uh, his ADP right now, which is 59 in season-long league. Um I think there's a very clear tiering of quarterbacks this year. I think you've got Lamar and Patrick Mahomes in tier one. And then right behind them, you've got Dak and Russell Wilson tier two. Some people seem to have put Deshaun Watson in that tier two with them, but I think he's pretty far below them. Um, so for him to be drafted at 59, I don't really see how it's worth it. Uh, Deshaun Watson is, uh, he's been consistent, obviously 26 touchdowns in the last couple of years, 4,000 plus yards. He's going to add those rushing numbers, but we've never seen him without DeAndre Hopkins. Um, and while I, I expect him to be probably fine, he might not be as good. And if you're taking him at 59 at that point, I just think it's not worth it. Uh, is there any, I guess, obviously he's going to be running. Do you think the running kind of balances off his floor so that he, I guess he won't bottom out as much as some people are worrying about? Yeah, that's that's the thing. He does have a he has a he has a floor. I mean, I'm not he's basically a better a slightly better Josh Allen. Um just, you know, maybe higher upside. I just don't really I just can't really justify taking him in like the fifth or sixth round when I could like I just get Josh Allen in the eighth round or, or can I I can get I don't know, Jared Goff in the twelfth round or something like that. Like I'll live with the two point three points for the difference. Fair enough. Uh, Richard, you have some, uh, you have uh, somebody as your, uh, your QB bust that's everybody has the arrow pointing up. Why is, uh, why is Dak Prescott's arrow going down for you? Uh, I'm, I'm pure regression. Uh, I don't know how he's going to work with McCarthy. I know he had, I know he had, uh, close to 5,000 yards his first time, but the norm for Dak Prescott is actually below 4,000 yards. And I just kind of, I kind of, so this is a pure regression thing. I'm not saying like, there's only two quarter, this isn't really a true bust, but I'm just saying that I would draft Russell Wilson or Kyler Murray ahead of Dak Prescott, and uh, that would make him uh, QB5 instead of QB3. Like a lot of people have him as QB3. I don't see him as QB3. I just don't. Because, uh, you know, all of a sudden, like, how many years we had him like at QB twelve, and then suddenly he has one. He suddenly has one big year, and uh, we expect the Cowboys are just going to turn around. Like like with him, with uh, you know, granted, uh, you know, Jason Garrett had to go, and they had to get a new uh, coach. There's, there's no question about that. But I just don't know uh, how McCarthy is going to run this offense, and. I, if he runs it like, if you think that Dak Prescott is going to be suddenly like Aaron Rodgers or Brett Favre, you know, I don't think it's, I just don't see it happening. I think, I think there's just a little bit of extra hype. So, you know, it's not really a bust, but I just think that I would, there's guys that I, there's two other quarterbacks I'd rather have ahead of him. So it's not really a, it's not really a big bust where you, where you thought, oh, I really blew it. Like, I mean, if you draft him third, fine, you probably, you probably get by. But there's, but uh, he doesn't seem. It doesn't seem like a safe pick. He's not as safe a pick as Russell Wilson. Now you could you could argue that Kyler Murray isn't isn't safe either. But he's got uh, DeAndre Hopkins there now, so you know there's a lot of difference. And also Kyler Murray's a far better passer. That guy just slings that ball, and and I, I just don't see Dak Prescott being as good as Russell Wilson and Kyler Murray. That's just my opinion. Uh, Richard, you mentioned the. Uh... I guess the the regression there, Kevin. Is there with without Jason Garrett as his coach anymore? Adding you know offensive minded coach like Mike McCarthy, adding C.D. Lamb. Is there any thought as unlikely as it is to Dak having a better season than he did last year with an extra weapon? Uh, you know Zeke is there practicing for the full year. He won't you know look a little winded like he did in the early last year. Uh, having a full strength offense without uh, under with under the uh, I guess the struggling mind of Jason Garrett. Yeah, I mean it's certainly possible. I, I wouldn't bet on it. Um, he had nearly 5,000 yards and 30 touchdowns last year, where I think he could improve is the touchdowns. 30 isn't like a crazy number. He could certainly have more than 30 touchdown passes. Um, the thing about Mike McCarthy is that he is used to running those three wide receiver sets, and I'm positive they didn't draft CeeDee Lamb just to have him or just to not use him. So, I mean, the usage, they're going to run a lot of three wide sets, and um, that it will make running the ball. I mean, they're always going to run the ball too, but – it's going to make throwing the ball pretty easy if the defense still have to key on on Z. So, I mean, that offense is going to be nuts. Um, I, I just, 
so I could see more touchdowns coming. I can't really see him getting back to 4,900 yards. That's fair. Uh, 4,900 yards is a, it's a tough ask. Um, moving on to my bust. I'm sure a lot of people know about this one. I'm going with Josh Allen. Uh, a lot of the same arguments that like Kevin you made for Deshaun Watson. He's right now on Fantasy Pros. He's ranked ECR at overall like seventy one. Uh, he's actually going eight spots after Deshaun Watson or nine spots after Deshaun Watson, and it's it's too much. I think uh, obviously his his rushing gave him a, a nice floor and a, a great ceiling. He's averaged uh, over five hundred yards uh, a year and eight, almost nine touchdowns a year. But with the Bills drafting Zach Moss and then Devin Singletary, you know, playing as well as he did last year, I think the Bills are going to try to get Josh Allen away from running so much uh, because he took some big hits and missed the game because of concussion last year. I don't think they're going to put, you know, their franchise QB in such danger. I think the rushing could come down a little bit, especially, especially the touchdowns and the attempts. And honestly, I the passing is still a little iffy, uh, iffy enough for me, even with the addition of Stefan Diggs, that it's not enough for me to say, hey, this is a, you know, he's going QB7 right now. It's not enough for me to take him over established guys on the hope that he gets better, even though he's still averaging career wise fewer yards and fewer touchdowns in the air than Tyrod Taylor did in his Buffalo years. There's not enough there uh, for QB7. Uh, I, I kind of disagree with you, John. Uh, come for you. Let him come. It's, Let him. Oh my god. I'm tweeting it. Tweet it out. Josh Allen stinks. Dude, they're enough of this Josh Allen, you know, like this searching, like just hard searching Josh Allen on Twitter for no reason. Anyways, me. Richard, you were saying. I was saying that uh, don't be too hard on Josh Allen. You get, Do you not know? I don't know why people cannot see that Buffalo is an RPO offense. They are. They are what they are. It's an RPO offense. They're just like, they're. They're not as uh, effective as uh, as Baltimore is, but uh, they are uh, they are uh, a basic they are basic RPO team. Sorry, I got interrupted there for a second. I mean, I'm not saying Buffalo's not a good team. Like McDermott's a good coach, the defense is great. Allen's gonna have all the opportunity, but with the defense being as good as it is, and the East looking as wide open as it once was, I don't think Allen's going to have to throw as much, and I don't think they're going to put him in a position to have to run as much as he did and have to make those plays because they have guys like Zach Moss, Devin Singletary, to take that pressure off of him. Yeah, but that's what uh, but that's what Frank Gore was there for. So, I mean, that's... I mean, Zach Moss is going to do more than Frank Gore did. No. Ageless as he is. No, that's the, that's the debate between Singletary and Moss, but we'll save that for another time. But on on the Josh Allen front, um, I have him as QB eight. Now I will admit um, that's that's currently. Um, I don't like him at QB eight. I think he should be um, closer to QB ten. But uh, but uh, I, um, but I have to adjust my rankings. That's only because uh, I just noticed that you shouldn't be at QB eight. You should be at QB ten. Uh, so for all intents Anyways. and purposes. Yes. Let's, Let's move, on, move on uh to the running backs here. Uh I guess Kevin you went first with the quarterback. So Richard, you can go first with the running backs. Uh me and you have the same uh running back on the top of our bust list here. Why don't you go ahead and talk about Miles Sanders? Uh yeah, th- this is the case of and a lot of people are talking about this is is that will Doug Peterson employ uh uh, well, it's, it's used to be a, a you know a three or four headed monster. You remember uh, Corey Clement, you know, and Darren Sproles, and and Miles Sanders, and Boston Scott. I think they think they were all in there at one time. I really don't think there's I really don't think there's any difference that's going to uh, uh, in the offense. So it, it you could very well be drafting Miles Sanders, and then you see a lot of Boston Scott. It could be. Uh, Doug Peterson could go for he could go in that hot hand uh, um, off a you know hard habits are hard to break with teams so I don't know if that's the way you feel Jonathan Wild the downside of Miles Sanders but I just feel that Boston Scott's just um, actually too good not to utilize. Yeah, for me, it's not that Scott is like some super amazing, like under underappreciated backup. It's more Sanders was his, you know, incredible numbers and all most of his production when the Eagles offense had literally nobody besides him. Like Alshon was hurt, Deshaun Jackson was hurt. Well, he's always hurt, and so is Alshon. But you know, like it was like JJ Arcega Whiteside, and you know, 
it, there was just nobody else to give the ball to, and Sanders was just getting everything he can handle. This year, it's probably going to be a little bit different. Jalen Rager's there now. Uh, of course, Alshon's still hurt, but Deshaun Jackson's apparently healthy. I just don't think he's going to get the same amount of touches and opportunity that he did toward the end of last year, and people are banking on that production. And as his ADP creeps up, I don't think he's going to be able to return, you know, end of the first round production. Yeah, I agree. Uh, all right. So, Kev, if you have any Miles Sanders stuff, you can uh, you can add on. If not, let's move on to your uh, your first bust. Uh, yeah, I could add some Miles Sanders stuff. He's good at football, and I'll leave it at that. I think he's good at football. That Eagles often should be better with Carson Wentz back healthy. Um, yeah, like you said, Boston Scott's not that worse. I mean, you have to consider he did this with without all those people, but that could also be looked at as like a positive for him, right? Like now the field is going to be a little more opened up. It's not going to be as, as much of a struggle as it is for him. But um, I mean, I can't really disagree with it. Sanders is someone that uh, I just like watching. So I think that's why I'm high on him. Uh, my first bust is Josh Jacobs. Um, Josh Jacobs is currently being drafted as the RB12 around there. Uh, my problem with Jacobs is just that uh, Las Vegas just keeps, that's so weird to say, Las Vegas just keeps signaling to us that they don't want him to be a three down back. Uh, he had 27 targets in 2019. They brought in, they drafted Lynn Bowden, who's basically like a, a gadget type guy. They just brought in Theo Riddick. They brought in Devontae Booker. These are all path catching back. So, oh yeah, like, Theo Riddick, I forgot about that. Yeah, so it seems to me like they just want him to be a two down back. And sure, he was great last year, 1,150 yards and seven touchdowns in 13 games, but that's like a if, if in today's day and age, especially since half PR half PPR is kind of the standard now. If you don't catch the ball like at all, it really limits your ceiling. Like you're really just counting on touchdowns then. And I don't see Josh Jacobs really scoring that many touchdowns with the Raiders offense. So I think 1,200 yards and seven touchdowns is probably as good as it gets. It might get 1,400 yards, eight touchdowns, something like that. But you're definitely not getting any of the receiving yards, which means I'm not going to take him over someone like Mixon who's going to catch the ball. I wouldn't take him over someone like Sanders, Drake, Eckler. Those dudes are all going to catch the ball. They're going to get you free, easy points from receiving yards and half a point per reception. Kev, I have him at uh, RB15. Yeah, that, that's probably about right. Yeah, I, I'd probably take him right above, like, I don't know, Gurley if I'm feeling feeling risky for net. Definitely take him above Le'Veon Bell, David Johnson, that tier. He's probably one of the last guys in that tier for me. Yeah, uh, so I guess moving on, uh, Richard, you have a pair of, uh, of rookies as busts. Why don't you uh, pick which one you want to go with and then uh, move on from there? Well, I'm going to take Swift. I, I think there's a little bit – There's again, this is a kind of like – is. Uh, <clears throat> Where does where does Carry on Johnson fit in? Carry on Johnson's not really that bad of a running back, and it's also the case of of how Detroit runs an offense too. That I just don't feel that the, they like to run uh, uh, they like to run uh, multiple multiple backs. Usually, uh, like when Theo Riddick, they sort of had Theo Riddick, and they had sort of like their main uh, bell cow, but it was always uh, separate. So. It's kind of hard to say about how 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 Swift. I can't see Swift getting uh, all these suddenly getting a majority of the targets being about. I just don't see a bell cow role because with Carry On Johnson, to me, it just seems like a uh, a timeshare. It's. I mean, Carry On Johnson is is going to get his carry. So I don't know. I just feel that uh, DeAndre Swift. Uh, I have him at. Um, at RB twenty eight, and I suppose that I suppose that's fair. But a lot of people are dry, uh, are uh, drafting him a lot higher than that, and I don't think you should. I have him at RB twenty eight, and I think that's about right. I don't know what you think, Kev, about uh, DeAndre Swift, but it's definitely a timeshare going on there. It has to be. Uh, I'm probably a little higher on Swift. I think he was. Uh, I mean, people are like looking at him as a second round pick, but he was the thirty fourth or thirty sixth overall pick, which is basically a first round pick. Um, he was like the consensus number one running back for a while until. C- CEH kind of burst onto the Chiefs, took him first. Uh, I think carry on Johnson is okay, but um, obviously the injury concerns, he's been hit or miss when he's in, on the field, and I think Swift is kind of just more of a steady guy, and I'd be more confident that he wins the job, or at least wins like 60-40, 65-35, than clear 50-50 split. So I'm a little higher on Swift, but I see where you're going. Yeah. The thing for me with Swift is that he can be good, but like Richard said, like Karrion Johnson's kind of there. He'll siphon carries either way, whether or not he's like super efficient with them. But the Lions running game is like never good, regardless of who they put in there. The Lions just can't seem to get a running game going. Um, I think the last good one they had before injuries took his career was Javid Best. And 
it's just a struggle until Swift actually shows something. It's a difficult situation to draft him uh, where he's going. Um, Kevin, I guess since me and you both have Melvin Gordon on the bus list, why don't you uh, get that get that conversation started? Uh, yeah, Melvin Gordon is is just a guy that I mean that actually that's the best way to put it. He's kind of just a guy. <laughs> just a guy. <laughs> yeah, like I, I get that he was a first round pick. I get that he's like a size speed monster and all that stuff, but the production just hasn't been there. Um, pretty much any advanced statistic you look at, he's just an over an average back, except like he's a good goal line back, which is all right, fantastic. But how many goal line opportunities is he really going to have on this Denver offense? Um, that's my main thing is when he was with the Chargers, like him and like Phil Rivers was marching up and down the field, scoring a ton of touchdowns, throwing the ball a lot. And Melvin Gordon could kind of pick up yards. He'd pick up points from scoring touchdowns from within the inside the 10 yard line and catching the ball. I just don't really see him doing that in Denver a lot. Uh, I'm not I'm not even really considering Phil Lindsay. To me, it's just that the Denver offense, I don't think will be very great. Like, there's no reason to believe it's going to be good. They have a defensive coach. They have a, a second year quarterback who I, I don't I didn't think he was very good in his first year, to be honest. I, a lot of people are hyped about Drew Locke, but I didn't think he was very good. So I don't really think that offense is going to be fantastic. Um, so I, I just don't really see where the opportunity is for Gordon. He's going low enough where you can justify. I think he's going like RB7 or something like that. So that's fine, but he's just not someone I see the upside with. Uh, Vic Fangio is a weird coach. <laughs> I mean, another Melvin, one. Yeah. Melvin Gordon for me is just, uh, I know you disagree with Philip Lindsay, but mine is Philip Lindsay is not really going anywhere. Like right. He's not going to disappear. Oh. I wasn't disregarding like, him. It's just like I can make that point without even bringing up. Yeah, him. without without Philip Lindsay yeah. in it, but he's a big part of it. I mean, people argue that oh, Garden produced, you know, in in L.A. with with Eckler, but Eckler had a very very defined and different role than Melvin Gordon did. Uh, Lindsay's somebody that can actually step up on the goal line and take those, you know, five yard, four yard touchdowns that Gordon feasted on in L.A. And as you said, if the Broncos' offense isn't going to produce all those opportunities, then that's a lot of his production gone. I mean, Gordon, we're talking about a guy that only averaged above four yards of carry one time in his career, in his in his five years in the league. Not to mention, he's only played 16 games once in those five years. Um, it's not, well, once was the holdup, but whatever. Um, it's not a great situation. And I think the touchdowns are coming down. It's just, if he's not scoring, you know, eight, 10 touchdowns a year, then what are you getting out of him? Sub four yards of carry, maybe 800 yards. Uh, it's not a great spot, especially with a very, very viable backup to take to take carries from him. So, if I if I may play devil's advocate here a little bit for uh, Melvin Gordon, is that I actually thought when uh, he held, ended his holdout last year, I actually thought uh, he's not going to do nothing. This is Eckler's backfield. They're they're just they're just going to um, play out the string and uh, but. He got out there, and uh, he actually he looked pretty good. So for the eye test, anyway, he did look a lot better than uh, I thought. And and you have to remember, before Eckler came along, or before Eckler emerged, uh, Melvin Gordon was a pretty solid uh, RB one. And so um, I'm not I'm not boosting Melvin Gordon because, like you say, it's not a great offense, and there are. Uh, I mean, we don't have to worry about Royce Freeman. I guess his his main competition is Philip Lindsay, but and I think there there might be a little bit of timeshare there. You see, this is the thing about Vic Fangio. I don't. I have no idea. This this coach. I don't know if you know about this cat, but this coach is just. I don't know. He's kind of. Well, he says well, weird stuff and. Huh? How do you feel about Pat Shermer? Because he's their offensive coordinator. Uh, he's all right. Uh, Giants, yeah. right? Yeah. He's all right. Like the, the Broncos were 28th or worse last season, scoring offense, passing yards per game, first downs, third down conversions, and red zone offense. They scored 16 or fewer points in nine games. I, how, I don't see that changing too much. No, but I, like I say, I mean, I'm I'm down on uh, Melvin Gordon. At first, I was, uh, at first I was uh, high on him, but uh, I don't know. It's, it slowly started dawning on me that uh, I think he's, for me, he's uh, RB23. Right behind, right behind David Montgomery. All right. Uh, I guess for uh, Richard, why don't you finish off with your uh, your second rookie there? This should be an interesting conversation. <laughs> J.K. Dobbins. Uh, well, first of all, uh, how many running backs have we got on the team? You got Gus Edwards, you got Justice Hill, you got Dobbins, you've got uh, Mark Ingram, and Lamar Jackson. So uh, this is really, I mean, I just don't see him taking over. Uh, 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 Mark Ingram's job. In fact, one of our one of our writers, I forget, the, I forget the guy who he went to a live game with the uh, 
And he said that Mark Ingram looks like a beast out there still to this day. He just don't, he, he said, uh, I, Kevin, do you remember who went to the, the Ravens game and, and was talking about it? Went to, Probably hmm? Probably Mark. Yeah. And he said that, uh, um, just Mark Ingram looked like a beast, like out there. He just owned the field. So I just, I just don't see it. Like Dobbins, Dobbins will, Dobbins will get in there. Um, we're, we're in this era where rookies don't make a lot of, uh, aren't making a lot of, you know, inexperienced, no preseason games. See, this is the thing was where I'm kind of a little bit, a guy like Dobbins, I really have to, uh, see some tape. So. All right. Well, it's, yeah, it's a tough thing with rookies, especially with somebody like Ingram around. Um, I guess Kevin, why don't you go with your third bust, uh, who's also competing with another uh, with another running back for touches? Yeah, so my third bust is Nick Chubb, and buckle up, boys, I've got stats. All right, so first eight games played without uh, what's the name, Dream Hunt, a hundred yards per game. Six touchdowns, 32 targets. Uh, last eight games, 86 yards a game, two touchdowns, and only 17 targets. Um, Kareem Hunt's good. Uh, newsflash. A terrible person. Good at football. Uh, on top of that, uh, Kevin Stefanski is coming over to be the new head coach for the Browns. And last year, Chubb was basically, he basically was the Browns rushing attack. Uh, he had almost 350 touches, uh, 1,500 rushing yards. And he accounted for 84.74% of non-quarterback rushing yards. And in Minnesota, like, Dalvin Cook was the guy. But between him, Madison, and Boone, uh, Cook only accounted for 55% of non-quarterback rushing. So I think Stefanski is going to come over with the mindset that I need to kind of balance my backfield a little bit. He's going to give Kareem Hunt more touches. And that, that played out even last year. So this year, I think it's going to be even closer of a split. Um, Hunt, uh, Chubb, again, is clearly a... It's kind of the same thing with Jacobs. Not as extreme, but he's clearly the worst receiving back in that backfield. In third down situations, they're going to have Kareem Hunt on the field. That's not even a question. Yeah, uh, Hunt is the steal of the draft. Right, uh, that's why you're drafting Kareem Hunt as like running back 26 or something. Yeah, he is. A, Hunt is a steal. If you if you pick up Hunt, you, you're getting a steal, I think. Yeah, I completely agree about the Nick Chubb situation. But uh, where have I got Chubb? I've got Chubb at RB10, which I actually think is a bit high but uh where have you got where have you got chubb kev uh i've got him at nine but i tend to not really think about these things too much until i have to do something like this yeah. and now i'm gonna move down <laughs> what uh, about you well, john oh you gotta you I'll gotta you gotta weigh in on chubb well going off of that i'll ask you guys where are you where do you where do you personally have kareem hunt i know fantasy pros has him at 28 Saying he's, you know, steal a draft. Where would you ideally, Richard, rank Kareem Hunt? I have him currently at RB26. Just behind Jones and ahead of Cam Akers. Or Ronald Jones I'm talking about here. Yeah, of course, Ronald. Uh, I have him at 28. Uh, basically, he is the first non-starting running back I would take. That's non- fair. Yeah, I mean, and I would take him over, like, some potential starter. Like, I'd take him over Ronald Jones. I'd take him over Cam. Let me see. Is he my highest uh, non-starting running back? He might be. I think he is. Yeah, I believe. Which he should be. He should be. He I is. Yeah, he he's, be. he's my highest. Yeah, easily. He's easily my highest non-starting running back. It's him, and then uh, of course the immortal James. White. Oh yes, James White, always, 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 always yeah. steady production. Eight points, no more, lo- no more, no less. James White is RB thirty two. All right, I guess we'll go on to my final, uh, my final bust. We mentioned him a little bit earlier. It's Austin Eckler. Why? Um, Why? <laughs> I don't think he's going to be trash. As I preambled at the start, he's not going to be trash. I just think a lot of people are remembering what he did in the first half of last year, uh, or like the first four games without Melvin Gordon, and people are... I don't think he's going to score that many touchdowns. I think he's even come out and said himself that he can't handle a full workload. He said he's not going to get like carries. He's not a bell cow. He knows, and the coach knows, that he's that's not the kind of player he is. He's going to maintain the role he had with Melvin Gordon, I think, and if those touchdowns come down, he scored a ton of them in the first in the first four weeks. Uh, he scored how many? One, two, three, four. Five. He scored six touchdowns through the first four weeks. That's not a rate that's going to continue. Uh, after week four, he scored zero rushing touchdowns. Just just for you know, just so you know. Um, receiving, then, receiving. Let's get to the receiving side of it. Well, of course he's going to get receiving touchdowns, but again, if he has no rushing touchdowns with another back there, with a check down a Charlie type of quarterback, he's got a check down Charlie quarterback, man. Tyrod Taylor is not a check down quarterback. Tyrod Taylor is a rushing quarterback. He will run before he panic dumps off to Eckler. Hmm. 
far more than Rivers did. Rivers Rivers is a check down quarterback. He cannot run. Tyrod will run for for an extra five yards before he checks it down. Mm. So the, I think the targets are going to come down. He was average, he had 108 targets last year. Um, I don't know if he's going to maintain that. There are weeks where he's getting 16 targets, like 12 targets. I don't know. Uh, in this offense with with Tyrod built around it, I don't know. Um, it's just a lot of people are expecting what he did the first four weeks, and I think. There's going to be some disappointment. I'm not saying he's not going to be good. I'm just saying there's room for disappointment if uh, if his body doesn't hold up, which he thinks it might not. With a full he workload. thinks it might not? Does he not? Oh. He's already said he can't handle a full workload. That's not the kind of back he is. So he said that. Well, okay. So he's got Joshua Kelly and Justin Jack. Jack, Kev. Kev, you, you can descend into this. You always have your wisdom on Austin Eckler. I know you like him. Yeah, I like him, but 106 targets or whatever is pretty unreasonable. Like, I, I just, I don't really see it happening. I don't really see Tyrod Taylor dropping back that many times to even pass. Um, I think it's more likely Keenan Allen keeps his targets share and everyone else goes down. If, Ty, if, if let's just say he loses 20 targets uh, and he loses 20% of his scoring opportunities because the Chargers offense is going to be as good, that's a pretty decent amount of things losing. And that's and last year was, let's be honest, a best-case scenario for Eckler. There's almost no way he builds upon that. Mm. I am RB12. <laughs> Yeah. By the way, you have 993 receiving. Yards. That's insanity. <laughs> I know it's a lot. I know, but that's 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 his strength, right? And it's... No, he's he's not matching almost a thousand yard receiving season with Tyrod Taylor. No chance. Correct. Probably true, but I don't think it's that much of a drop off. Well, he's gonna bust. Put, put it like this: He last year he had Justin Jackson as his backup already. Now Joshua Kelly's in the mix. Uh, with Melvin Gordon, he was RB fifteen. Now it, I don't think he's gonna get better than what he was throughout you know w- throughout the season. So where's where's all this production gonna come from? Like Kevin said, last year was probably best case scenario. I don't think he's gonna get better than he was last year, but he's still been getting drafted. What RB fourteen? Uh, regularly, like 13 on Fantasy Pros, so I just don't see the room for profit there, and there's definitely going to be a little little drop-off with the new QB. Okay. Yeah. Points to consider. Points to consider. Yeah. Oh, I got to weigh these things, too. You got. <laughs> you, you do have me thinking. You do have me thinking. But uh... All right, let's move on to the wide receivers, because this is a pretty long show here. Let's see if we can get through these ones a little quickly. Uh... Kevin, why don't you start with uh, with Adam Thielen there? Your uh, your first bust on the list. Um, yeah, Adam Thielen is a guy who I I I don't think I've ever rostered, but um, obviously he did good things when he was healthy last year. He had a down year, being very unhealthy. Um, I just don't really see like the Vikings as a, a an offense that I want to target for pass catchers. Um, especially like Adam, I get that Stephon Diggs is leaving, and that should theoretically open up a bunch of targets. But Adam Thielen was already pretty heavily targeted. I don't really see that going up. So um, then you're 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 basically counting on a guy who's like 30 years old. Um, I just I think he's being drafted probably just a little bit too high. I don't really. I don't really think he's going to be a bust or anything like that, but he's a little too high for my my taste. Uh, the couple guys I'd rather have in front of him, like Tyler Lockett, I definitely have in front of him. Calvin Ridley, DJ Chark, those kind. Of, uh, I just don't think Minnesota is a high volume pass attack. Yeah, uh, Richard, anything to add to Thielen? Uh, no, I I have to admit I agree with Kevin. He's not a high temperature. Uh target for me he's sort of a medium medium temperature target so um yeah he's not a high temperature target it just seems kind of uh, he seems kind of like a bland kind of target there's nothing really i don't know he had that one good stretch like where he was uh the the top uh wide receiver for for the first eight games of the season a couple of years back but ever since then, I don't know. He just had that injury. Um, he's middle of the road. He's good enough. He's going to get targets from Kirk Cousins. I, it's kind of hard to. It's kind of hard to see where the. Uh, there's. He, he might get a slight increase in target share with without digs, but there's uh, Ola B.C. Johnson and and of course the um, uh, the Jefferson the uh, rookie entering the fray. So I. But uh, he just doesn't seem like a really exciting pick for some reason um 
All right, I'll go with my bust now, uh, my first wide receiver bust. Uh, it's one that I shared with Kevin uh, since you mentioned low-volume passing attacks. I'm going to go with A.J. Brown. Uh, obviously, he showed that he's a very talented receiver, uh, amazing after the catch, but he only averaged 5.3 targets uh, per game last year, which was tied for 53rd among wide receivers. Uh Obviously, he's going to get more this year, but the Titans, there's not a high volume passing attack, like you said, uh, about the Vikings. It's, they average, they were dead last in passing attempts per game last year, just under 27 uh, th- passes per game. Um, with Derrick Henry still there, I don't think they're going to start passing it around. I think it's still going to be the Henry show. And Brown's value is all going to hinge on whether or not he can continue breaking long runs or long gain after the catch. Of course, he has the talent to do it, but... That's not really what I want to bank on for production uh, where he's being drafted. And if he doesn't get a sure, you know, target share and, uh, you know, basic floor production, it's tough to draft him at. Where is he like 50th ish overall now? So it's it's a it's a tough spot for for me anyways. I don't know about about uh, what you were thinking, Kevin. Yeah, he's wide receiver 19 right now, and I, I'm pretty much the same way. Uh, it's just the volume. You're basically counting on, I'm not saying they're fluke plays, but these, these type of plays are very barrier. You can't, uh, as much as people talk about Amari Cooper being a boomer bust guy, like A.J. Brown is a boomer bust guy. He had 10 games last year with three catches or less. Um, I, I mean, that's that's a problem. Um, it, not even to mention the target count. Like, I don't think they're going to ask Ryan Tannehill to throw the ball a ton more. Uh, Corey Davis is still there. He gets a lot of targets for some reason. Uh, the, the, the thing, the, the offense revolves around Derrick Henry. And even if A.J. Brown gets more targets, there's no – I don't think you can just assume that he's going to be as efficient with them this year. It's still, um, a rookie wide receiver that receives a thousand plus yards is some is is a that's a rookie receiver on the Titans getting a thousand plus yards. I just can't agree with you guys. I, th- I have him at WR nineteen, and uh, I think that's. I think if you draft him, I don't think you're going to be, going to be disappointed. You're going to get WR2 numbers, I'm pretty sure. Like him and his uh, his uh, fellow guy from Ole Miss, D- DK Metcalf. Both those guys, they're just they're physical freaks, and, they're, and they showed it. So I mean, I think people will be disappointed certain weeks. Like Kevin said, it's super boom or bust. I think there's going to be weeks where he catches like three passes for 30 yards because he couldn't break anything. And those, I think they'll, I think they'll pop up more often than, than you'd like taking him as fantasy pros ranked him 39th, which is 38, sorry, which is high. Uh, Richard, why don't you go with your first receiver bust? My first receiver bust will be, as soon as I get my page up, uh, I will take, uh, Odell Beckham. I, you know, I really, this is, he is the, uh, quintessential diva wide receiver. You always think that he's going to do better. He's He's gone to Cleveland. With, I mean, you would have thought that uh, with Baker Mayfield, there's just no connection there. There was more of a connection with Jarvis Landry. I don't see the connection with Odell Beckham, and I don't see it going to be happening this year either. Um, I currently have him ranked at uh, WR12, but that's that's a that's a nervous WR twelve. I don't. I, I have uh, Juju Smith Schuster ahead of him and R- Robert Woods just behind him. Um, I would be. You know, it wouldn't surprise me uh, if he doesn't live up to. Uh, if he doesn't end up a, a top ten receiver, um, I don't. I think he'll be. I think he'll be top twenty. In fact, I would. Can I? I'll stick my neck out too. I bet you. You know, we were talking about Adam Thielen before. I think Adam Thielen uh, could probably uh, probably have better numbers than Odell Beckham this year. Hey, let me put that. I'll make that a bold prediction. Even I like I that. Am- I have Thielen on my Scott Fishbowl team. I like that. I like that. <laughs> okay. uh, in the interest of time, Richard, why don't you move on with your with your second bust there? All right, uh, second bust. Uh, okay. Um, I have. Well, we talked about Tyrell Williams in the. Uh, in the news, so I'm gonna go with CD Lamb. I don't know where this hype for CD Lamb is coming from. I mean, there are like, okay, he's gonna be how many three wide receiver sets are the Cowboys going to do? Are they gonna do it on every single play? You know, it's gonna be Amari Cooper, and you know it's gonna be Michael Gallup. So, I mean, you're gonna add in suddenly, you're gonna add in CD Lamb. Like, how many how many three wide receiver sets is he gonna be in? I just don't I don't understand the hype for for uh, CD Lamb. I think a lot of people are, he's overhyped and uh, people are, you know, 
thinking, he's, oh, this guy, he's, he's worth... I've got him, I got him as WR71. Sorry. Oh, that is low. 71. Oh, Kevin, I know you have a rebuttal for this one. Oh, my God. I'm here to argue. All right. Randall Cobb last year. We all agreed he's pretty washed up. Uh, yeah. 83 targets, 55 catches, 830 yards, three touchdowns. Uh, that's basically a, almost a floor. You could pretty much bank on 70 targets. Randall Cobb played a snap share. Let's, let's see what a snap share. It doesn't even it out for me. 74% snap share. That's pretty good. I would say that he will be in a lot of three wide receiver sets. If you're getting a floor of Randall Cobb, and I think he's obviously more talented than Randall Cobb, and the ceiling is that he's better than Michael Gallup, and he takes Michael Gallup's spots, that's way more worth what a wide receiver 70. Wide know, receiver but... 71. Richard, do you have him below, like, <laughs> D.D. Westbrook and, and like, yes. Michael Pittman? And what? N- yes, I do. He's below Michael Pittman. No, he's, no, no. He's no, below. No. He's below no, no, Stills. No. He's below Fitzgerald. He's a rookie. I don't trust rookie uh, wide receivers. I'm not buying in. Action you want on an over under? C. Lamb is great. You got. He's wearing 88, man. <laughs> well, yeah, that counts for a lot. 88 Dez's number, right? Yeah, if you wear 88 for the Cowboys, you're automatically guaranteed 85 targets. That's just oh, 88 <laughs> targets. 88 wow. targets. There it is. No, he 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 belongs in the WR4, WR5 uh, conversation, I'm afraid. Oof. All right. Well, since we're talking about the Cowboys, I'll go on to my uh, another bust of mine. Amari Cooper, um, I don't think he's going to be terrible. Obviously, uh, but I think he was already boomer bust. Uh, he had a lot of weeks where he wasn't producing, and now with CD Lamb there, who's going to get his 88 targets with his Randall Cobb floor and Michael Gallup producing as well as he did. Uh, actually, they had about the same amount of production over the course of the year, I believe. Um, definitely toward the end of the year, the targets and the yards per game were very, very similar the last six or seven weeks of the season. And it's just, I don't, with an extra receiver there, I don't know if Cooper is going to reproduce another, you know, wide receiver nine season. And if he does, then he's going to do it over the course of, you know, three weeks. And then the rest of the, the rest of the time, you're just complaining that you ever drafted him. So I think where he is, uh, fantasy pros has him at 14. The guys around him, like Juju, DJ Moore, uh, they're just safer uh, with a better floor, especially with Ben back for Juju. And Cooper is eh, a little very, very iffy for me as a dependable, you know, wide receiver one or borderline two as uh, as he's being drafted as. They traded a lot to get him, remember? Well, just the one first round pick that Kevin bet on and lost. But, you know, <laughs> favorite bet. But we still let you on the show. Cannot believe you got that <laughs> I could not believe it. Um. All right, Kevin. You have you, you may have the same the same bust again. So why don't you go on with uh with the scary one? Oh, uh, yeah, Terry McLaurin. Um, very similar to the the, the other guys. Uh, Washington threw the ball 489 times last year, and they were playing from behind the majority of the time. So I, this year they're not going to be much better. Um, it, it's just a combination of the team's not very good, the quarterback's not very good. There's nothing on the offense that shows me that they're going to be very good. He had He's a good player, don't get me wrong. I like Terry Terry a lot. But he had 919 yards and seven touchdowns in 14 games last year. Uh, while that's pretty okay, that's not really wide receiver 28 stuff. Um, he doesn't really have this. The most important thing is that he doesn't have this because that offense is just there's no way it's going to be good enough for him to have like a 1,400 yard, 12 touch. So if you're drafting him at wide receiver 28, you're pretty much just banking on getting the wide receiver 28, which is not what I would. Yeah, uh, Kevin, I totally agree about McLaurin. I mean, uh, as he showed with with Dwayne Haskins, it wasn't uh, great. I mean, just even after his you know his introduction to the league between week seven and seventeen, McLaurin was uh, WR forty eight. You know, scored seven points a game. It wasn't uh, it wasn't a great year. And like you said, uh, at twenty eight, you're drafting him kind of for for what he was last year. I don't think he's going to have a ton of improvement. The ceiling's not there, and the floor is really bad considering how bad the uh, the Washington football team is going to be. Uh, moving on, I guess, to tight ends now. Uh, I'll go with mine first. It's Tyler Higby. Uh, ton, ton of hype coming off of his uh, some record-setting numbers from the end of last year. Between weeks 13 and 17, uh, he finished as the tight end one, uh, averaged 11 targets a game, 104 yards a game. But Gerald Everett was injured, and Gerald Everett is no slouch on the other side of the formation there. Uh, good receiving tight end. Cooper Cup is going to be fully healthy again. Robert Woods is still there. And I don't see Tyler Higby, you know, continuing to be this amazing receiver. Uh, keep in mind that he played 58 games, you know, in his career. And in 56 of those, he didn't go for 48 yards. Um, so, I mean, the first 58 games before his record-setting run, 
it's just a weird thing. I don't see him doing that again. I don't see the Rams focusing on Tyler Higby as their main guy when Cooper Cup and Robert Woods are there. And it's just so much room for disappointment with Tyler Higby going as the TE7 in in a lot of leagues. Yeah. Similar situation with me and Austin Hooper with David Nioku there. I just don't see, like, if, if there was one main tight end, the thing is, is that Austin Hooper and uh, David Nioku, you kind of, it's a similar thing, like Tyler Higby and uh, Gerald Everett. They're both going to get, one guy's going to have one big game, and then the next guy's going to have the other big game. So, you know, it, and I, I just, I don't think you can trust uh, production for for uh, when you have two tight ends on a team that are both uh, capable and, pr- and productive in their own right. Yeah. The way I think about it, and I think this applies for both your guys, is on those offenses, there's just way too many mouths to feed, and neither of them are talented enough to command targets. Yeah. All right, big Kev, who is, uh, who's your bust? Uh, my bust is Hunter Henry. Uh, he's currently going as tight end six, I believe, six or seven. Um, and he's just not that good. Um, even with Phil Rivers throwing him the ball, he was tight end He was tight end 12 in 2017 and tight end 8 in 2019. He obviously missed 2018 with injury. It's, that's like not bad, but it's not great either. Um, there's no reason to believe that. Again, we've talked, I feel like we've talked about it like multiple times, but Tyrod Taylor is just not going to have enough volume to really make him a viable fantasy option. Um, in 2017, 2019, when they finished like that, Rivers had second in pass attempts and seventh in pass attempts, whereas Tyrod Taylor in his three years as a starter, 24th, 25th, and 25th in pass attempts. So uh, there's just no way there's going to be enough volume. He's not going to get the yardage. He's not going to get the targets. He's not going to get the touchdowns. And if you're drafting him at tight end eight, again, it's just a very limited ceiling. You're kind of banking on name recognition to be honest like I'd rather have so many other guys behind me. I'd rather have Gronkowski Woo. Uh, yeah. oh yeah Gronkowski looks like he did five years ago that's what they say I put him up to um, TE7 oh. I'm going with the full narrative on Gronk Brady doesn't have enough practice time with Evans and Godwin so he's going to go back to what's familiar throwing it to Gronk uh, that, that's going with the narrative there's nothing wrong with that I think that's completely right you know, that's why I put Gronkowski at TE7 he's a he's a target and actually uh um, leaning towards a medium to high target for me. Temperature. I like it. Medium, well, medium th- to high temperature. <laughs> I think that wraps up our uh, show for the week. Uh, that was our busts uh, show. Thanks to everybody who stuck around for the uh, the longer length of this show, but I think it's it was worth it. We got through a lot. Unlimited. Gotta be unlimited. That's right. <laughs> gotta be unlimited all right guys uh again everybody thanks for listening uh richard kevin uh we'll do this again next week all right peace all right take care man uh have a good day thanks for listening everybody